When I was a large baby or a small toddler during the Cold War, my parents went to visit the Eastern Bloc and left me in the care of my maternal grandmother, Mopsy, who dropped, or allowed to be dropped, a tin on my head, leaving an indentation which remains to this day. I don't know what, if any, lasting impact it had, but I often wonder if I will be a very different person, for better or worse, without that formative experience. Dear listener, what was your origin story? Was it Bandagongo? Cow pokes, cow folks, every kind of cow children, cow girls, cow boys, any non binary, cow gals, cow pals, hoping no brigands will kill them, cow kin, cow skin, whatever cow you be. All cow children, every afflicted pilgrim, countless millions, any demography. Cow pokes, cow folks, every kind of cow children, cow kin, cow skin, whatever cow you be. Bandagongo! 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 Bandagongo, a memoir of a life live, of a world lost and... I'm not sure quite sure what gained. I'll see to the subtitle later. Remind me to tweak it before I die. In any case, having written every other thing there is to write, here, at last, is my own story. Chapter 1. Sport, sport, sport. Some years before Bandagongo suddenly and violently curtailed life on planet Earth, I made a firm friend. You know him, and I know him, my partner in life, and much more besides. Scott. Scott and I had first met around three years before the Bandagongo business. He was a bright young cricketer and had travelled halfway around the world to go professional. Since I had a strong association with the game, and since I had lately inherited my home and grounds, I offered to put young Scott up as a lodger. I had no shortage of rooms to offer and was glad of the company. In truth, our arrangement was more social than financial. Scott had come from the Antipodes to play the gentleman's game, but found himself playing the gentleman. G'day! You must be Trev! Th- that's right. Trevor Quixote's the name. Cricket the game, as they say, though I'm more sort of a professional observer these days. A little too creaky for the crease. Tell me about it. Pleased to meet you, Prescott, isn't it? I read your letters with great interest. Call me Scott. I always will. And you know, and you did. I always did. Scott's mere presence was a tonic to me, and after a few rather glum years, which I shan't bother you with, I found myself revitalised by his company. Friends from the club found his impact on me striking, even uncanny, though they were less impressed by the man himself thinking him uncultured. They were blind to his merits. What he lacked in classical education, he made up for in raw humanity, the resilience and dexterity that set early man over his dinosaur rivals. Scott would join me at breakfast and at leisure, and I would join him in training. We kept fit together, playing great bouts of tennis for which our young men's bodies were perfectly primed. Yet despite his physical splendour and keen eye, he was passed over by one cricketing club after another. My references did nothing to help him, and one day poor Scott simply broke down and cried. The dream was over. Oh, we wept together. We never knew for certain what the fault had been found with him, had led to the National Committee to ignore his swift skill at the bat, or his ebullient personality. Well, if there was malice behind their decision, they certainly paid the price for it. Chapter 2. The Death of Dry Land One morning, we read a new word in the newspaper. Bandagongo! The best astronomers of the world had identified a new character in the night sky, a meteorite comet growing ever the larger. Soon, even the worst astronomers could see, and with the naked eye, the great Bandagongo, the vast, approaching mass of rock. Bandagongo, the ninth continent! Eighth being the moon, of course. The question was, would Bandagongo be content to remain in the sky, or was she keen to settle down among her earthly brothers? Was there space for a new world within the old? Frankly, no. Astronomers around the globe swore that our home and our planet would not be struck, but would rather see the sight of her life. 
Ninety-nine times the size of the moon, they said, is how she would appear, and the seas may rage and churn in tidal ecstasy, and the folk by the coast had best keep a Wellington boot handy, that was for sure, but we would not see a collision, an apocalypse, an end to humanity. Scott? I have come to a resolution. Happy new one! Oh, quite right. I, I know we both harbour a secret fear, a fear of Bandagongo, and uh, I've decided that it doesn't do to panic in the streets. It doesn't do, does it? No. No! Scott, how would you like to take a panic in a boat? I don't imagine I'd enjoy that very much. Then let us make it a pleasure cruise. You know and I know that the apocalypse is not imminent, but I'm very much afraid that the people, the folk, the public... They will go mad when the time arises. Mad, Scott. Mad. Sounds pretty tricky. Say we were to take my brother's yacht and spend a few weeks' leisure in the Celtic Sea, we'd miss the entire panic. A couple of weeks and we could really develop our sea legs. And our sea lungs. If the tide surge and a tsunami batters Britain's coast, we could ride it out. We'll return to Mastodon afterwards and see how this old semi-detached mansion of ours has weathered the storm. My word, yes. I was sure you would agree, and so I've already packed our provisions. We'll set sail this afternoon. This very afternoon. It looks like you've packed enough food for a month. That's right, Scott. Lots of sandwiches and an entire cheese. I've never seen the like of it. Neither had I, Scott. But this is a strange time. If we can roll these down to the dock, we can take my brother's boat and slip out long before the frenzied crowds think to attempt the same. Wise plan! I think so. Best case scenario, we have a pleasant gad around the coast of Ireland and come back to find nothing has changed whatsoever. Worst case scenario, hell is real, but heaven isn't. That's a spirit. And uh, that was that. While the world trembled, we set out to make a holiday of it. On a boat, one always learns something new about friends. I quickly gathered that Scott knew all the words to the ode messing about in boats, while he, in turn, learned of my disdain for it. We learned how to pull the ropes and billow sails, those are the simple tasks, as well as how to push and unbillow them respectively. We kept well, fished for fishes, and learned to keep our stomachs there on the rolling waves. Bandagongo was big! By day nine, we were dumbstruck in fascination at its great mass above us. When the newsmen had said it would be larger than the moon, <laughs> I chuckled and, and Scott slapped his thigh. We thought, at best, Bandagongo and the moon would face up to one another, would contend for supremacy in the sky, with the newcomer sent away as a pretender and without supper. But the moon was knocked into a cocked hat and no mistake. Bandagongo was the size of the sky, and as the night fell on day fifteen, so fell Bandagongo. I cannot describe, for my mind will not let me remember, the hour of impact. Suffice to say, everything went blue. The waves claimed us as they claimed all the world. Land, air, and life were snatched away. All was salt and pain and raging tumult. Yet by some million to one chance, we did not die. The Ashen's turmoil lasted the best part of a week, during which we neither of us ate nor spoke. We merely held tight and managed a little wine to keep our throats in our minds. When the storms were over, we searched for land, but with a ruined sail there was little we could do but drift. We saw no ships, no wreckage, no land, not even Ararat. From what we later came to understand, every nation in the earth was lost in an instant, under storm surge. Nobody lived. No mountain prevailed. I thought of someone else, Trev. Someone else who might be dead. Go on. Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia. He surely drowned. I don't know who that is. No? No. Oh. I'm sure I've never heard that name. He fought in the war. Camels. Guns. T.E. Lawrence, the name was. Oh, T.E. Lawrence. Well, of course. Surely drowned. No, Scott. He died in a motorbike collision before this whole apocalypse affair began. Oh, that's terrible. What a tragedy. That it is, Scott. That it is. So do you reckon we're all that's left? What? Us alone of all the world? What a prospect, Scott. We've got to keep positive. Don't think about the friends who died. Think about the enemies we outlived. Boy, they sure got their comeuppance. For surely sure. Drowned, a lot of them. Or crushed by the sheer weight of water. And we lived longer. At the end of everything, I suppose that's the only measure of success. And so the days went. Distraction, stubble, desperation. When we finished off the cheese, it seemed like the age of Trevor and Scott might be through. 
we, we held out hope. And hope was satisfied. That brings us on to chapter three. Words. I, I, I do realise that all of this is words, really. But this is the part of our life where we really took up the pen, as you'll see. But first, we required an audience. Now, although the world had disappeared below the surf, it seemed that one island nation had been spared. Through binoculars, we shared them, each taking a single ocular, we spied a green and yellow land. Like the vivid colours of mixed peas and corns, we set what remained of our sails, and the remnants of our boat found the shore and shattered upon it. The turbid waters that surrounded the island had kept it in isolation for many years. None had left and lived, and the few who had arrived found no escape. But it hardly mattered, did it? With every other nation lost in the SOG, there was nowhere to go. Now, I'm no Gulliver, and Scott is less like Robinson Crusoe than you might like to imagine. We weren't hardy adventuring folk, just two shipwrecked cricket men. We found a village, and in it an empty cabin, and we took it for our own. The neighbour gave us a sort of dry soup, which, in retrospect, might have been porridge. A and we settled, we lay low, and we kept to ourselves. I, I shan't bore you with the details. Years went by, uh, of course they did, and uh, Scott and I lived together as man and man. As to how we made a living for ourselves, we were most practical, using our resources in the way that most enriched our new world. We decided to write out, from memory, the great literature of the lands we had left behind. Just as England, Europe, and the rest had fallen to the waves, so the world had lost all trace of Shakespeare, Jules Verne, and Homer of Troy. Their stories now only lasted inside our hearts and our memories. I put it to Scott that we should recall their tales as close as we could to their original forms and publish them for our newfound neighbours. He could see the potential at once, a good income and the preservation of culture. We had an obligation to the past and to the future. Back in our house in England, I often read to Scott and we shared a love of high adventure. From time to time, we'd reversed our roles, but we both agreed that mine was the clearest speaking voice. Scott had a splendid grasp of the language, but it gave me pain to hear Wilde or Tennyson intoned in quite so Australasian a manner. Now, while my writings in England had been a solo venture, conducted in the cool privacy of my study, Scott and I resolved to tackle the classics together, and would write from breakfast to noon on the patio outside our cabin. After a siesta, we would make jam together, or swim, or go out into the community to find fresh customers. Our first work was the hardest. We had chosen that old favourite, A Tale of Two Cities. We could remember the beginning and the end just about word for word, and we had a general idea about the middle. But we strove too hard for perfection, eventually abandoning it entirely. We debated, even argued. Scotty had picked up a habit of finger-wagging which riled me up dreadfully. Well, we had our debates, did Scott and I, and in the end we resolved to be less perfectionist, deciding it was better to capture the spirit than to exhaust ourselves straining to recall details that no longer existed anywhere in the world. After that, our novelization of Hamlet was pulled together in a matter of days. We felt that the story had a universal appeal, with a cruel murder matched against a grisly comeuppance. We grew braver in our choices, even adapting around the world in 80 days. To our readers, a gazetteer of fantasy, and to us a work of nostalgia or geographic record. Inevitably, we reached our great work, our Bible, a book of uncalculable power. For the best part of a decade, Scott was reluctant to touch it, thought we could only mar or dishonour the thing and bring down curses into our blessed lives. As for me, I was counting on divine intervention to keep us from heretical divergence from the original. In the end, I think I persuaded them that a bad Bible with good intentions was better than no Bible at all. The argument unsettled him and we even spent a little time apart. But in the end, we went at it, writing the highlights, the battles, and histories together, then going to our own ends of the cabin to work on epistles and prophecies. I'm sure it wasn't spot on, but we did our level best. I fear we may not have captured quite the historical Jesus. I shall leave it to his ghost to work its usual magic. Our biggest tiff emerged from that simplest of all stories, Noah's Ark. We wrestled, both literally and metaphorically, over the ending. See, the rainbow appears grand in the sky, and the voice of the Lord thunders down, and we must go forth and multiply. But I don't know that we can really have him claim that he'd never flood the earth again. But it's in the book. At least that's how I remember it. It's how I remember it, too. But 
Given the circumstances that brought us here today, the weight of anecdotal evidence, which you must remember in this case is the very same thing as scientific evidence, tells us that the Lord could have said no such thing. The world was as flooded as flooded can be. We must be misremembering, or else the original was flawed. Maybe it was different this time. I was there. It was entirely wet. I can tell you that for free. If that holy rule ever existed, surely that was the breaking of it. We weren't in Ark, though, so this was different. Whole nation survived. The islands. Scotty was wrong, but, but, but I wasn't sure how. My, my, my brow darkened and my mood went with it. It was the first time it really dawned on me that, that we too were not the Ark. When Bandugongo fell and the nations drowned, if there was an Ark involved, it was the islands of the no-men and the foe-men. Scott and I were just spares. We hadn't preserved so much as a breeding pair of hamsters. We could bear nothing together but words. Chapter 4 Darius the King in his Raging Now... Foeman was not a monarchy, but tried telling that to our occasional visitor and worst neighbour. He was the one man who might have helped us hone our books into something more accurate, being as he was the only other escapee from what we used to call the civilised world. His list of names and appellations was long. My favourite moniker for the fellow was this, The Man Who Ate the World. But that's another story, and one I shall not tell. He was a would-be dictator for all his charm, and we didn't care for him one jot. This fellow, uh, Cantor, came knocking one day. Scott and I were at home, working on the second volume of our Old Testament, when Cantor called at the house, and when we, neither of us, answered the door, had the cheek to let himself in. Said he wanted our approval, our blessing. I think the chap was suffering from a sort of personal crisis, and wanted us to tell him we admired his pluck. He'd come to the wrong house. I can tell you that for free. Scott soon gave him a piece of his mind. Never before or since have I seen such a display of animal rage. Certainly not from Scott, who is ordinary such a quiet, reserved sort. Cantor got no sympathy from us, and the next we heard he was dead and all but forgotten. Young Cantor did leave us with one interesting thought. Every king, every queen, every royal house of Europe has perished. All known heirs obliterated by the fall of Bandagongo. Where do you suppose all that monarchy goes? It's on us, my friends. Trevor, Scott, you're just as likely as me to be the King of Spain, the Duke of Normandy, the Tsar of all the Russias, and much more besides. That's a thought. Don't be seduced, Scott. Remember where such arrogancy leads. Only doom. Doom has nothing on me. All you have accomplished, I've done the same without the benefit of a boat. I came here for your approval, but I don't need it at all. Neither of you have the gumption to claim your birthright. My resolve is as blue steel. Well, you can take your resolve somewhere else. Your kind of monarchy isn't welcome here. You heard, Scott. Out you go. You'll be sorry! Well, we weren't sorry. Not a bit. His notion that we were somehow owed crowns was a lively idea, but purely academic. It's the law that makes kings, and the law drowned with the courts and the countries. There were no kings here. Having said that, <laughs> once in a while on our respective birthdays, Scott and I would wake one another for breakfast in bed and address one another as Your Majesty and Your Highness through all through the day. Just a bit of fun. As to Cantor, he elevated himself to such a dizzying height that nobody could remember which god he was claiming to be. Well, fame comes and fame goes. His went and he simply couldn't last. He never really found his niche like we did. I think it was the weather that did for him in the end. I shan't write any more about him. He was proud, he was loud, and I shan't be his chronicler. Let him be like Herostratus the Greek, famous only for being forgotten. Now to chapter 5, The Burgeoning. When the earth was swamped, when every nation but one was pulled so abruptly down into the bath of the world, humanity was very nearly obliterated. I had somehow never expected the lost land masses to return. But quite suddenly, and quite unexpectedly, balloonists brought the report. Land ho! It was vast, soggy, dangerous, and empty. There was no good way and no good reason for either of us to reach it. But we could not ignore it. Reckon there'll be bodies all over. Scott! And fishes. The land came up awful sudden. Will there be fishes flopping about in surprise? The very geography. We have a nice life here, Scott. 
comfortable. That's true. You're not thinking of going off to the mainland, are you? Not on your nelly, no. But you know what they say. If you don't like your neighbours, move. I don't mind our neighbours. Now, about our, our apocrypha. The work went on, but there was something different between us. The world was changing, real estate was plentiful, hearts could roam. I found myself spending less time writing and more time gadding about the Fomonian towns. When we first arrived, we hid ourselves. We became insular, made a quiet life. Now, with an expanding world, we found ourselves free to live expanding lives. Scott began to divide his time between our cabin and his home from home in Spiratic Cadribar. We worked separately and met only occasionally, comparing notes. In our time apart, I felt myself grow tired and slow. We had a fallout after he printed a revised New Testament. It was good, closer to the original, I think, but I don't know if that really made it better than our earlier rendition. He was celebrated and celebrated solo. I was worried, worried he was casting himself as a messiah. He called it My Word Yeshua and seemed for a while to inhabit that exalted position. I was concerned for my friend and I was envious. When we met again, we fought about anything and nothing, that his words were too few or too many, that my volumes were full of men and lacking in heart, that he had made the transition from vulgar to lofty, while I had attempted its opposite and failed to be either. Your chickens are neither hot nor spicy. I pushed him away and found that left me alone. I am not a well-travelled sort, or I wasn't until recently. Scott, though, had once voyaged half the earth to be with me. That first meeting feels a lifetime away. Sadly, he found such comfort in the foeman capital with his lunches and his cigarettes and his doting audiences, and may I also say his wife and his children, that he swore never again to travel. A narrow view in the face of the earth's mystery and beauty. Perhaps I am too hard on him. It may have been the memory of his last fateful boat trip, enough to make a seasoned traveller into a landlubber. Nonetheless, it, it brings us up to Chapter 6, The Great Continent, or, or I might call it The Borderline Racists. While Scott remained in Spiratic Cadrabar, I could not resist the lands that arose out of the Azure Main. What would they become, and what was their charter? New mountains, hills, and ice plains. For some years the land was astoundingly empty. Pioneers who disliked their neighbours and came to the new world learned that they needed to seed the ground, plant new trees, and expect little from their labour. The land was fertile, but the work was hard. Over the coming decades, though, my travels brought up a number of surprises. Fields of grass, which couldn't have lasted years under salt sea, occasionally a full-grown willow, and on one occasion horses, a creature not native to Foman. To this day, I have no explanation for these phenomena. I explored, I returned, and wrote of what I had seen. Was this new land the old continents, risen again from their watery grave? Or was it Bandagongo, making itself at last known and habitable? I cannot say. I hope for the former, but wrote of the latter, calling it half-jokingly the West. Geographically, it was indeed in that sunset direction. It had, in common with the old New World, great potential, unknown resources, and a haunting vastness. Some say, indeed, that this is a West of infinite magnitude. I cannot say. I came here to roam, to learn, and to search out inspiration. That and evidence. I would return each time to the peopled world with newfound words and description of these most potent places. I had run out of old tales to borrow, so I wrote guides to the new. I must be responsible for a great many westgoers. The most of them, I hope, will not regret it. So I would return every year or so to the island and to Cadrabar. Sometimes I would find that Scott had been writing in my absence. He'd put out a slim volume of Australasian tales boiling down the fiction of a continent to the length of a novelette. I had a read of some of it, and found some pieces were practically synopses. I had a mind to take my friend to task over this hurried work, a shoddy sort of entertainment without detail or charm. But perhaps this was merely the Antipodean style, or perhaps I was envious in some way of his brevity and popularity. We still made merry, and ate and drank together, but there seemed no time for sport. I started to spend longer away from the centre, and longer away from Scott, 
My old home was gone, and during my brief visits to Foman, I always felt a guest in Scott's homeland. After a life of acquaintance, I found that I was the foreigner, and he the native, and man of property. I was looking for my place in this world, and decided it must be in Bandagongo, in the West. What was the American West if not a land where independence could be tried and trialed? I grew my moustache full long and carved notches in my gun. A lonely life. I should say the notches did not denote deaths. I only have a body count of one. I will sketch out that story for you before I move on to my own dotage and demise. My little town out in uh, Bandagongo was on the border. N not a border I drew, I ought to say, between the West and the rest. It was good for tourism, I suppose. Folk wanting a safe trip out from Foman would come and straddle the border, so they could say they'd set foot in the deadly West. Few would go any further. The West was perilous. It held all forms of death. Few returned. But my border town was safe. A sort of last chance saloon. Well, there's nothing like the word safety to start a worry. One thing led to another, with paranoia pulsing like the heart of a living beast, as it is always prone to do. Where there was a border, there were border patrols, border checkpoints, borderline racists. They invited me to join, to sign up with the vigilantes to bar any eastward traveller. But their hearts were unkind, and their unkindness violent, and their violence illogical. I did not care for their zeal. Not at all. I don't know the proper ways of handling popular uprisings, murder and discrimination, so I did what seemed right. I arranged a sit-down meeting with the worst of them, and when the discussion proved fruitless, I shot him in the head. It made a little hole, just under his ear, and his brain flopped out like a jelly, and a pair of little dogs ran in and carried the brains away in their mouths. Well, it might have been the perfect crime, if they'd only taken the whole body. There are never large dogs when you need them. So, I quietly stepped down as mayor, resolving that I would be better off as a wanderer. Just as every man must give a speech on his birthday, so I feel everyone who reaches his deathbed with sufficient gumption ought to write out a full confession. Lives, after all, are more interesting than deaths, and funerals are dull things. For whatever reason, people are reticent when it comes to the world's most exciting topic, the resurrection. Until I rise again and find the vindication in the bosom of Christ, I should like to make my own judgement of my life and works. Uh, better we judge ourselves than to be immortalised by the faint memories of our ageing associates. As I say, the proper measure is on its way, but since my body is now crumbling beyond means of repair, I have set my final days to memorialize myself, that my name might outlast my flesh. Here is Chapter 7, The Holy City and the Death of Trevor. My death. Of course, I cannot write about my own death. At a certain point, I must hand my story on to the monks and scribes I have in my travelling party. Uh, for now, my hope is Jerusalem, the, the Holy City, that I might find its original site and die there. That, or I perish en route. We shall see how it goes. In that case, the monks have kindly agreed to bear my coffin, carrying me to my rest as if I were St. Cuthbert. Yes, this body, once revivified by Scott's pubescent presence, is reaching its end at last. Scott is also dying, or so I am led to believe, somewhere far from here. I like to think we match one another in our decay, and will breathe our final breaths as one. A romantic notion. My party travelled west with a sextant, trying to find the east. I'm sure it must be here somewhere. Even if the old continents were replaced by the new, somewhere on the earth there must be a site holier than any other. I could tell many tales of our journey, but I shan't. Only this. After marching, chanting, and blowing of trumpets, we found ourselves at a great body of water, and took it as an omen. I felt like a Mormon. Those curious folk who sought the sea, but stopped too soon at the great salt lake. I approached the waves alone, and lowered myself down onto the shore, and crouched there thinking of Scott on the islands. The water stood between us as if we were on two sides of a pane of glass. When the wave rushed in to greet me, I seized it up and brought it to my mouth. That's right, as seafaring men used to kiss the dry earth when their ship last came to shore, so I fell upon the water, embracing it with all signs of affection. I came away without finding any salt in the savour of the kiss. No sea, then. Or not any sea I have known. I knew that we would never see one another again. It's at this point that my narrative reaches the present day, and I must interrupt my final chapter with another. 
I had planned to roam for six or seven years before finding my prize. I had imagined a mosaic fate, climbing a mountain to see the Holy Land and perish before I could ever step foot on that ancient capital of the world. Uh, however, everything has been thrown off course now, as we must enter Chapter 7B, The Surprise. Though perhaps I'm wrong to call it a surprise. Who should turn up begging to join my solitary party but Scott himself? Scott, who I had been confident I would never meet again. I'd resolved myself to it, and now find my noble end unravelling. Reports of Scott's frailty had been much exaggerated, and against my better nature, I found my old heart beating stronger. Scott has called my bluff with regards to my death, so now all my plans are up in the air. It's really quite annoying. Sorry, Trev. I'm not looking for sorrow, Scott. I'm looking for pity, and I'm not going to get it in the company of a friend now, am I? I guess not, but I heard you were off on one final adventure, and I simply couldn't resist. I was to be the tragic hero of my own story. Why? Oh, Scott. Scott, Scott, Scott. We had our time together, and we did well. Better than well, we found fame that we never sought. But you found another life and it made you glad. And I wanted to find my own way, my independent success. But here you are. Like a bad penny or a good dog. Scott and I have gone mountain climbing, leaving my monks, my scribes and congregants camped at the bottom. Perhaps we will, both of us, see the promised land from this vaunted spot. You left your scribe behind, so there's no one writing any of this down. I find that if I say the words out loud, I remember them the better. Hey, look, it's our old house. Don't be silly, Scott. It is. It's your old semi-detached mansion, except it's entirely detached now. Good Lord, what's it doing here? Not much. Sitting down the other side of the mountain. Maybe when the seas destroyed everything, they forgot to destroy that one little bit. Let's clamber down and see if it's full of fish. I suppose that means we aren't on Mount Sinai. If this really is our house, you're on the wrong continent. You know, Scott, I don't really understand continents. Not anymore. Not since Banda Gongo. Why would our old home, of all things, be waiting here for us? Perhaps it's a coincidence, or a prize, or a trap. There's no mistaking it. That's Barclay Gardens, all right, or a very good replica. Brick for brick, I know this house. How many times did we carouse and cavort in its gardens? Fifteen. The gardens are all gone, Trev. Hmm. Same creaky gate. Do you happen to have a door key? No, but I know an old burglar's trick. Is this some sort of ploy of Scott's? Some scheme? Some folly? A man-sized grave? Or a reward from the Lord? I'm going to see if my favourite pillows are still there. Hey, it's my coat. Not too moth-eaten. Not too bad. We should check out the wardrobe while we're passing through. Not just passing, Scott. This is home. Surely we were brought here to stay. I thought you were a wanderer. I thought you had a trajectory. I'm feeling a little light-headed. Perhaps a sit down. Always some comfy chairs in the library. My word! It's like the great library of people. All these books that have been lost to the ages. My word! It's like the great library of Babel. All these books that would have been lost to the ages, and here they stand. There's so many! The Three Musketeers! Look! Jennings! Ivanhoe! And my letters, our notebooks, everything I sent to Wisdoms! Tom Sawyer! Why did we never think of rewriting that? I'll be honest, I've never read it. Well, I never read 20,000 Leagues, but you made me write that all on my lonesome. That explains much. Hey, Trev, we can take a look and see how close we got. On no account, open that book! Eh? We mustn't read any of them. The world must never know what we found here. It's dawning on me what this miraculous hoard really means. These books are not our vindication. If these survive, then everything we've achieved together was for nothing. Or worse, these perfect originals will show up every flaw, every error, every misstep we made in our entire slapdash catalogue. My gosh, you're right. These books will be our ruin. But I would like to check. Put that volume down. All right, all right. I just wanted to check to see what the musketeer was really called. Any book we open will lead to nothing but regret. Nobody can know about this miracle library. We should burn it. Yes. Burn it to the ground and then back up to the sky again. We'll raise it completely. I'll see if there's a tinder box in your desk. There might be some gasoline in the cupboard under the stairs. And so it was, as the stars came out, that we set a torch to this house, this old home which had been miraculously spared. It pained me to burn books, but I held tight to the idea that we had saved their knowledge long ago. I guess I should be writing all this down. I'll call this chapter, What a Turn-Up of the Books.
You don't think we should have saved one of the Bibles? Oh, you know, I hadn't thought to. Well, I'm sure our version will suffice. There's one thing I ought to tell you, Scott. It's time, I think, to be candid. When we first met, I told you I was too creaky for the crease, that I was unsuitably lanky, awkward, and lacking in grace for the world of professional cricket, and that was why I was not on the national team. But it was a lie. I was fit. As fit as any man who ever stuck a wocket. They would not have me on the team because I was and remain what they used to call a gay man and homosexual. I know that, Trev. It's something we've always had in common. That it is. That it is. That it is. But I worry if your exclusion from the world of professional cricketing wasn't because of skill or even class or culture or refinement. They kept you out through association with me. The fact I was your sponsor and your friend put you on their blacklist. If it wasn't for me, you might be the greatest cricketer in the world right now. But I am the greatest cricketer in the world. No one else plays. You have me there, Scott. You have me there. But I'm sorry I never told you the truth back then, that living with me put an end to your sporting career. I knew all along, Trev, but I like you. You're my best friend. And if it wasn't for you, I'd be drowned in a dead old skeleton out in the bottom of the sea. Now, are we finally going to get married or what? It's a long time since I proposed, and you have a wife now. I thought this was meant to be the lawless West. I suppose it is. Would I be committing bigamy, or would you? That is the question. But I believe you'd be committing bigamy. I'd just be committing monogamy. Oh, well, it was a thought. Oh, let's act on it before it flies away, as thoughts are prone to do. If I could get away with a murder, I'm sure you can get away with a bigamy. My word. Yes, don't you remember? Everybody gets one. Like Moses. This one is rather more like King David. What a kiss and over. Well, with it clear that we love one another very dearly. Very, very dearly. We can, at long last, live happily forever after. Until we die. And even then, from beyond the grave. (laughs) That was Cow Children, Banda Gongo by Ben Swithin, with Tom Hagley as Trevor and Ben Swithin as Scott. Cow kin, cow skin, whatever cow you be. Hello, dear listener. Nobody ever asked for a Cow Children origin story, and if this episode inspired hatred in your heart, go forth in hope that it will rarely, if ever, be mentioned again. But as far as I'm concerned, all Cow Children tales occur after the classic age of westerns, but before now, mainly in the early 1990s with fashions to match. But nobody knows. Nobody knows what they're missing. If you wish to pretend that you, too, are in the 1990s, why not apologise for all incidents of lateness with a sly, sorry I'm late, somebody privatised my train.